Our first uh, presentation today is how long to continue aspirin after ACS PCI in patients with atrial fibrillation. Insights from Augustus. It's going to be presented by uh, Dr. John Alexander uh, from the Duke Clinical Research Institute in Durham, North Carolina. Good morning, everybody. Uh, Dr. Drachman, Dr. Dr. Curtis, uh, panelists, ladies and gentlemen, it's my pleasure to share with you this secondary analysis from the Augustus trial uh, on how long to continue aspirin after ACS PCI in patients with atrial fibrillation on oral anticoagulation. Next slide. These are my disclosures. Uh, the Augustus trial and these analyses were funded by the Bristol Myers Squibb Pfizer Alliance. Um, my disclosures are also publicly available on the DCRI website. Next slide. To remind you, the Augustus, uh, Augustus trial was a randomized double blind trial in patients with atrial fibrillation who had an indication for oral anticoagulation and an acute coronary syndrome and or percutaneous coronary intervention with planned P2Y12 inhibitor use for at least six months. 4,614 patients were randomized to either a pixaban five milligrams twice a day or a reduced dose in appropriately selected patients or a vitamin K antagonist with a target INR of two to three. This randomization was open label and patients and providers knew which drug they were taking. Then in a factorial design, we randomized patients also to aspirin or double blind placebo. Uh, and um, this, as I said, randomization was double blinded. Most patients received aspirin from the time of their ACS event until the time of randomization. Um, the primary outcome was ISDH major or clinically relevant non-major bleeding. And secondary outcomes included death or hospitalization and death or recurrent ischemia events. Next slide. In the Augustus trial, we demonstrated that in patients with atrial fibrillation and a recent ACS or PCI on a P2Y12 inhibitor and anticoagulant, placebo resulted in a significantly less bleeding uh, than aspirin, about a 50% reduction in bleeding. And there was no significant difference between patients assigned aspirin and placebo for the secondary outcomes of the composite of death or hospitalization or ischemic events that included death, stroke, myocardial infarction, stent thrombosis, or urgent revascularization. Next slide. Though not statistically significant, there were numerically more of some ischemic events in patients assigned to placebo than aspirin. And I'll highlight here stent thrombosis 11 versus 21, myocardial infarction 68 versus 84, and urgent revascularization 37 versus 47. Because of the small numbers, none of these were statistically significant. Another analysis that we've conducted of the stent thrombosis event importantly suggested that almost all of the increased risk was early within 30 days of randomization. Next slide. There has been speculation that the risk benefit balance uh, for antiplatelet therapy may change over time. And in this illustrative figure by Shomig, you can see that uh, theoretically, the risk of stent thrombosis is highest early after PCI and gradually comes down over time, whereas the risk of bleeding with potent antithrombotic therapy is constant over time. This would suggest that there's some period of time, um, some point in time, where the trade-off of more potent antiplatelet or anticoagulant therapy may change. Next slide. So assuming that there might be a risk benefit trade-off that changes over time in Augustus with antiplatelet therapy, our objective was to explore the balance of risk that is bleeding and benefit that is ischemic events between randomization in 30 days and between 30 days and six months with aspirin and placebo among patients in Augustus. Next slide. The Augustus primary bleeding endpoint, that is ISTH major or clinically relevant non-major bleeding, and the secondary ischemic outcome of death, stroke, myocardial infarction, stent thrombosis, or urgent revascularization are arguably not of comparable severity. We thus created 
three composite outcomes for bleeding and three composite outcomes for ischemic events that reflected severe events for bleeding and ischemic events, intermediate outcomes for bleeding and ischemic events, and broad outcomes, the broad is collected in Augustus for both bleeding and ischemic events. And what's included in each of those composites is shown here in this table. Next slide. We then used Kaplan-Meier methods to estimate the event probabilities for each composite bleeding and ischemic outcome from randomization to 30 days and from 30 days to six months. We calculated absolute differences, and that's important when I show you the results. These are absolute differences in bleeding and ischemic events between aspirin and placebo. And all in analyses were done using the intention to pre treat principle, including all randomized patients and all events. Next slide. Just to remind you about the baseline characteristics of uh, the Augustus population, there were 4,614 patients enrolled. The median age was 71 years. The median weight, 83 kilograms. The median CHADS-VASC was four and HASBLAD score was three. 29% were female. They had high risk of or high frequency of uh, chronic kidney disease, hypertension, heart failure, diabetes, a low rate of prior stroke or TIA. About half were on oral anticoagulants before randomization. The vast majority of patients got clopidogrel as their P2Y12 inhibitor with small numbers getting prasugrel or ticagrelor. And about a third of patients were enrolled in each of the three subgroups subpopulations of an acute coronary syndrome treated with PCI, an acute coronary syndrome treated medically, uh, or elective PCI. And the average time from ACS or PCI to randomization was six days. Next slide. So this slide shows you the um, uh, primary, uh, the key bleeding and ischemic outcomes. Three, remember there's a broad, intermediate, and severe bleeding outcome, and a broad, intermediate, and severe ischemic outcome for aspirin and placebo between randomization and 30 days. Next slide. Um, you can see that uh, aspirin uh, increases bleeding or placebo reduces bleeding compared to aspirin uh, for the broad outcome, the intermediate outcome, and the severe outcome. Next slide. Um, there's On the ischemic outcomes, there's no difference in the broad outcome. And there's a numerically lower rate of the uh, intermediate ischemic outcome and a statistically significant reduction in the severe outcome uh, between randomization and 30 days. If you compare the increase in the severe bleeding outcome and the decrease in the severe ischemic outcome, they're almost one, they're both almost 1% in the in opposite direction. Next slide. Um, oops, back. This slide shows you um, the bleeding and ischemic outcomes from 30 days to six months. Here again, you can see a reduction with placebo compared to aspirin in bleeding um, using the broad, intermediate, or severe outcomes. And you can advance. Um, and next slide. Um, whereas for the ischemic outcomes, there's no difference in the broad or intermediate or severe outcome uh, be, uh, between, between aspirin and placebo between 30 days and six months. Next slide. To further explore the um, timing uh, between randomization and 30 days for the increased risk of bleeding, of severe bleeding, and the uh, decreased risk of severe ischemic events, we uh, develop these Kaplan-Meier plots. And you can see there's a continuous monotonous increase in bleeding from zero to 30 days and decrease in ischemic events from zero to 30 days um, with aspirin compared to placebo. Next slide. From 30 days to six months, that monotonous increase in bleeding over time continues uh, with aspirin causing more bleeding than uh, placebo. However, there's no difference in ischemic events between aspirin and placebo, in severe ischemic events between aspirin and placebo from 30 days to six months. Next slide. Now, this analysis has some important limitations. 
As I mentioned, patients received aspirin prior to randomization in both arms, and this could have influenced subsequent bleeding or ischemic outcomes. Um, the severe intermediate and broad composite bleeding and ischemic event outcomes may not be com of completely comparable severity. This is a post hoc secondary analysis and the analysis idea and plan, the composite outcomes and the time windows were all developed after seeing the initial Augustus results. And, the num and finally, the number of events is small, particularly for the more severe outcomes and when subdivided by time window, creating the potential for type two error. Next slide. Um, so in conclusion, among patients with atrial fibrillation in a recent ACS or PCI, receiving a P2Y12 inhibitor and oral anticoagulation with a Pixaban or Warfarin, the use of aspirin acutely and for up to approximately 30 days results in an equal increase in severe bleeding and reduction in severe ischemic events. After 30 days, aspirin continues to increase bleeding without significantly reducing ischemic events. So using aspirin up to 30 days might be reasonable, and these results should inform patient-centric shared decision-making regarding the ideal duration of aspirin after an ACS or PCI in patients with atrial fibrillation uh, receiving oral anticoagulation. And next slide. And these uh, results have been accepted uh, for publication and circulation, along with an apixaban warfarin characterization using the same approach uh, and uh, the articles in press. Thank you very much. Thank you, John. That was uh, excellent. Our uh, panelists are, uh, for this study is uh, Julia Index. So, Julia, go ahead. Thank you. So, it's been a long held tenet that dual antiplatelet therapy is essential in the management of patients after PCI. But the conundrum comes with patients who need anticoagulation because of their atrial fibrillation, because then when you add the dual antiplatelet therapy, you create triple therapy and then increase bleeding risk. And the Augustus trial really was crucial and pivotal in examining whether aspirin afforded a benefit over placebo in this patient population uh, who need anticoagulation using a pixaban or a vitamin K antagonist and their P2, uh, P2Y12 inhibitor. First, I wanna congratulate Dr. Alexander and his colleagues. This is a really superb secondary analysis, looking at the time course for potential benefit and harm with aspirin. To reiterate, they find that the only time when aspirin may be a benefit is in the first 30 days, where there's a signal for an increase in severe ischemic events. But after 30 days, I think that slide showing the Kaplan-Meier cur curves, that is absolutely startling and remarkable seeing those two curves for aspirin placebo completely on top of each other after the 30-day mark for ischemic events. But just as Dr. Alexander pointed out, we want to be focused on the absolute risk difference. And in turn, when you turn that ratio upside down, you get the number needed to treat and to harm. So in the first 30 days, if you calculate it, the number needed to treat with aspirin to avoid a severe ischemic event is about 100 the number needed to harm with aspirin to cause a severe bleeding event is also about 100. So first two points, 100 is a, a kind of a largish number. But also, again, just as Dr. Alexander pointed out, it is a trade-off. It's an equal amount of potential benefit as harm in those first 30 days. So I want to I wanna make a perspective here, it's something we should keep in mind. So one day when the guidelines will be updated, and they surely will, I think this trial and this sub-study will be essential. And a future guideline committee is going to think about how this data might inform a recommendation. But keep in mind that if a treatment benefit equals its risk, that's not a class 2A or even a 2B recommendation. That's a class 3 recommendation. So with that backdrop, um, to kick off this discussion, Dr. Alexander, I'd like to ask if you have any further insight as to whether there may be a patient population or a time duration where you think the benefit of aspirin might yet exceed its, its, its potential harm. Maybe we should be thinking of an even shorter time period, maybe, maybe just seven or 10 days that might have a net benefit, or should we be doing some more research on this topic? So, uh, uh, Julia, th thank you for those uh, comments. Um, so, uh, I, I just want to reiterate here: uh, you, you have to. One of the 
uh, issues with Augustus is that all patients got aspirin for a period of some number of days before randomization. So, it, you know, we, we don't have a great insight whether no aspirin um, is acceptable from the data that we have from Augustus. Um, and then your a second comment is related to this issue of equal risk. And one of the things we've talked a lot about and we uh, designed this analysis to help address is, are the endpoints we're comparing of equal severity? And so we developed these three composite outcomes. And I at least feel like what we call severe bleeding in this analysis and severe ischemic events, both of which have a range of severity within those categories, are roughly equal in severity. So I think um, that, that's important to take into consideration. And then regarding patient populations that have bleeding risk and not ischemic uh, benefit or ischemic benefit and not bleeding risk, that's where I think we need more, more analysis and more data. Um, as far as a time period, I don't think we see it. If you, I mean, that's part of why we developed these Kaplan-Meier curves and I can't identify a shorter time period um, that would be reasonable, recognizing that what we did was post hoc. But I do think there's more work to be done in identifying particular, particular subgroups of patients, maybe based on angiographic characteristics or other variables where there's more, where there's a different differential risk benefit trade-off and more tailored therapy can be used. It's terrific. Well, um, thank you so much. I'd like to uh, thank Dr. Alexander and Dr. Indic for a wonderful presentation and perspective, certainly very thought-provoking.